This video covers some material from chapters 4 and 5 with a really quick detour into 27 from your analytical chemistry textbook. Uh, I'm going to talk about statistics, specifically least squares fitting, and then some calibration methods. So, uh, least squares fitting is the process by which you take a data set and you fit a straight line to it. Uh, or at really any line, but we're going to talk about straight lines. This is the process by which you would make a calibration curve from your data, and so we'll talk about what a calibration curve is. Uh, but, basically, you're going to take uh, some sort of measurement at various analyte concentrations and get a signal, some instrument response. And so you're going to be able to predict at a given concentration, this is the response we should get from the instrument. The mathematical model you use to make that prediction is your calibration curve, and the way to create that model is called the method of least squares. So the model that we're going to use in this case for linear least squares is a straight line, so y equals mx plus b. In this case, x is going to be your independent variable, your concentration, and y will be your dependent variable, your instrument response. To do this, you make the assumption typically that the x values are known exactly, which are within a lot of confidence, uh, and all the errors are measurement errors in y. You're going to find the parameters m and b from the previous slide that describe the line. And the process of doing this, what either you could do by hand or what Excel does when you click add trend line, is to minimize the sum of the squares of these things called residuals at each point, thus the term least squares. What a residual is, is the difference between the actual measured value and the value of the line at the same x value. Uh, so when you have, when you make your data points, or when you measure your data points, you get a little bit of scatter. And you're going to draw a line that minimizes the amount of scatter, the distance from each point to the line. Some points may be farther from the line than others, and that's okay. What matters is the total distance of all the points from the line, you know, at that point. And what you do is you take the residuals, you square them, because they can be positive or negative, and then you move the line around until the, the total sum of all those squares is minimized. When you do that, you also get out some information that can help you calculate the goodness of fit. And so this is what Excel is doing when uh, you tell it to display the R squared value on your trend line. Uh, what the R squared is, is a measurement of how much uncertainty there is in the line. Uh, in other words, okay, you minimize the residuals. Now how big is that? that sum of the squares of the residuals. If it's pretty big, the R squared isn't going to be very good. If it's very small or even zero, then the, the fit is going to be perfect and R squared is going to be exactly one. Uh, in other words, the term sum squared error is going to be zero. There's no error between uh, the line and the data points. So to actually construct a calibration curve, you're going to want to make samples that cover a wide range of analyte concentrations and then measure them. You also analyze a blank. Uh, the reason to do that is in case your instrument gives some signal when you put in a blank. Ideally, you put in a blank, you get no signal, but sometimes you get some. So you would want to subtract that blank signal from all the analyte signals and then plot that corrected signal versus the concentration to get uh, a set of data points that look like they should fit onto a line then use least squares fitting to find the equation of that line. So let's say these are your data points. Uh, you're going to use least squares fitting to draw a line, the best line, through them. And then you'll measure your unknown. And so you'll know, you'll get a signal from your unknown. So it may say 11.5 on this scale, maybe. And so you plot your point on there. You don't really have to do that. You can just use the equation. And what the equation is going to tell you is you'll be able to solve for your x value. And so in this case, your x value is, you know, about 6. All right, so measuring your unknown, getting a y value from the instrument, tells you what the x value is. Usually that's concentration. Uh, you can evaluate your calibration curve, first of all, using the r squared value. It should be good. But second of all, uh, you want to make sure that you have the correct range of serial dilutions. So this would be a bad range of serial dilutions. This would be a good range. And the reason is that you want to have at least one uh, calibration point that is higher in concentration than your unknown. You also want to make your serial dilutions with the same contaminants as the sample, if possible, 
so that you can make sure that none of the contaminants in the sample are contributing to the signal and therefore giving you an artificially high concentration. Going along with that, you want to use constant analytical conditions, so same instrument parameters, same kinds of glassware, all that stuff. The reason that you want to have, on the previous slide, you want to have uh, concentration standards that are higher in concentration and lower in concentration than your unknown is that sometimes the instrument response is not linear with respect to concentration at all concentrations. So this is a case where that's true. Uh, above about a concentration of five units, whatever, this line deviates from linearity. At low concentrations, the model y equals mx plus b is a good one, but at high concentrations it's not, and so you need to know that in order to use your model. The range over which the, con the linear model works is called the linear dynamic range. Uh, and so in this case it's very straightforward. You just use y equals mx plus b. Where the concentration is still increasing but not linearly, we just call this the dynamic range. So in this range you could potentially fit some sort of other equation, a polynomial or whatever, um, to still be able to predict with slightly less certainty what the concentration of your unknown is going to be. Outside of this dynamic range, now we see that we have totally lost instrument response as concentration goes up. Concentration goes up and absorbance stays the same. That's bad. So that means that if our concentration of 10 and a concentration of 100 were analyzed, we'd get the same absorbance. That doesn't tell us anything about our unknown. So above the dynamic range, our, our calibration can't be used. The process of making a calibration curve is essentially figuring out the K in this equation right here. So for any method that you want to use, you want to be able to relate signal and concentration with some proportionality constant, call it K. Uh, for gravimetric methods, so weighing for titrations, this is very straightforward. Uh, it's pretty straightforward for a calibration curve and less so for other analytical methods. One of those other analytical methods is called a standard addition. What you do in this is, so you analyze your unknown multiple times, and then you add a known amount of, a, of the standard. Record the signal for this new mixture multiple times, do some math, which we'll talk about in a second, and then repeat as necessary. You make a plot of signal versus the amount of the analyte that you've added, and that plot tells you what the concentration was in your original sample. This is the standard addition equation, and what you should notice about it is that it looks like the equation of a line, y equals mx plus b. So, the, so in, on the plot there, the points from the x-axis, and the, or from the y-axis and then over to the right, are your standard additions. So the one that's right on the x-axis, no standard added, is just your unknown. And then you add your standard to the unknown and the signal goes up. What you do to analyze this data is you forecast that line, you fit that data to a line and then extend the line back to the uh, x-intercept where y equals zero. At this point, x equals negative b over m, and so this point tells you the concentration of unknown in your standard, or of standard in your unknown. A similar but different method is uh, the method of internal standards. And so you're still making additions to your sample, but in this case, the internal standard is a compound that is not the analyte, but has a similar response. The idea here is that you calculate what's called a relative response constant or response factor, and use that to figure out the concentration of your unknown. And so this is uh, sort of what you can, what you can uh, use to visualize that. So if you have two, um, two substances, A and B, in your unknown, um, if one of them, so let's say A is your analyte and B is your uh, internal standard, the response factor for this case would be about 2. If your concentrations are equal, A gives you about twice the peak area as B, and so you find your response factor. Then, if you know the concentration of B in a different sample, you can figure out the uh, concentration of A by rearranging the equation above uh, and solving for concentration of analyte. Internal standards are used when your sample volume is not constant, so that uh, you may not get the same peak area every time, even if you injected a sample with the same concentration. 
a related problem is if you have possible sample loss prior to analysis from evaporation or something like that. Um, and also when instrument parameters are not constant from run to run. An important criteria here is that the peaks can't overlap. You have to be able to calculate the two areas independently from one another.